joining us this afternoon. I know there's a an evil flu going around, and there's beautiful weather going around as well. Um, I'm Elizabeth Dark, Associate Director of Programs for the Canine Review. And uh, before I introduce David, I wanted to point out to you all that we have a panel next Tuesday in this room at 4.30. Um, this is part of uh, Misha Rai and Keith Wilson's fellows project called Proof Casts a Shadow. And we are bringing to campus uh, three writers, Gabriel Belot, Grace Shui Liu, and Nei Se Sorino. Um, so they will be here having a conversation with Keith and Misha, uh, and there will be Q&A, there will be a reading, it's going to be a fine time. So please mark your calendars for that as well. And to prepare if you want, you could look online. We have a number, how many do we have up now? Just two. Two, we have two pieces connected to the Proof Cast the Shadow project. Um, right now, I'd like to introduce, introduce David. Not only is David Baker one of contemporary poetry's most gifted lyric poets, he is also an indispensable member of the Kenyon Review family. He contributes, his, his contributions to this literary arts organization are countless, but perhaps the most obvious one is his role as the journal's poetry editor for over 25 years. Good God. <laughs> <laughs> Which is longer well, than only 20 of them. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> We're glad. He has raised the Kenyon Review to rare national prominence. He also began his teaching career here at Kenyon before being lured away by the charms of Granville, Ohio, where he holds the Thomas B. Fordham Chair at Denison University. David is the author of 12 books of poetry and six books of prose. Among his awards are prizes and grants from the Guggenheim Foundation, National Endowment for the Arts, Poetry Society of America, Mellon Foundation, and the Society of Midland Authors. In his newest book, Swift, he gathers poems from eight collections, but first opens the volume with 15 new poems that continue Baker's growth in form and voice as he investigates the death of parents, the loss of homeland, and a widening natural history, not only of his beloved Midwest, but of the tropical flora and fauna of, the Caribbean, of a Caribbean island. Together, these poems showcase the evolution of Baker's distinct eco-poetic conscious, conscience, his mastery of forms both erotic and elegiac, and his keen eye for the shifting landscapes of passion, heartbreak, and renewal. With equal curiosity and candor, Baker explores the many worlds we all inhabit, from our most intimate relationships to the wider social worlds of neighborhoods, villages, and our complex national identity, to the environmental community we all share. And if you haven't read Dan Chasen's review of Swift in the most recent New Yorker, you should. I hope you will. Dan, who points us toward David's way of making a virtue of hesitation, says to read Swift is to appreciate the full range of the poem's formal resources, their attunement to cycles and processes rather than to mere outcomes and effects, their patience over the long haul. Please join me in welcoming David Baker. I know almost everybody here. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Thank you for coming. It is a beautiful day. And there are many temptations to be elsewhere. It is National Poetry Month. One of the temptations. It's also National Confederate History Month. It's National Pecan Month. It's National <laughs> Grilled Cheese Sandwich Month. Oh. Kite Month. Frog Month. Stress Awareness Month. Irritable <laughs> Bowel Syndrome Month. It is National Sports Eye Injury Awareness Month. I looked. I, I wrote them all down. <laughs> So, I, yeah, I've been the poetry editor of our magazine since 1995. Good Lord. Is that right? Yeah, 95. But I have been with the magazine since, uh, in some form or another, since I first moved here um, to teach in 1983. Yep. Yep. It feels like a homecoming um, when I come back here every time. And I'm really pleased 
to be able to say that on a day that's also when this new book comes out, is to launch this book here um, with you. It's very special. I appreciate it. I'm just going to read you some poems. And I'm going to read um, some poems from the new section of Swift to start with, just so you get a little sense. And now I'll read a few older ones, maybe 10 poems or so, something like that. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. And so, you know, I don't even know how to read from I'm just going to read the first one. <laughs> that right? Yeah. People worry about which one to read. Read the first one. <laughs> Pastoral. Here at the center of a field of green leaves, waving center of a grief, I can't see far enough to tell how it will ease. It will not ease. It goes on and on now, as yours does in sunlight and in rain, holding hands with her in the last minute. Sky so vast, hear the wheat roar. Huh. This one begins with a little bit of a line from Lowell. It dawns on me to mention that <laughs> here again in one of his poems, a poem called Epilogue, one of my favorite lines from Lowell. Why not say what happened? This one's for my father who died um, two years ago and about a week. Why not say what happened? This terrible breaking, this blow. Then slow, the dogwood strewn like tissue along the black road. No. The busy pollinators, the breeze in the pine shadows, in the aftermath where I drove back there. And two bones of smoke lifting a head along the shoulder in the high new green weed bank running beside the asphalt. No, I had come from my father. Nothing more common, nothing more than such. I could not breathe for the longest time over and again, there was something deadly, she said, in it. Of the genus Butio, as B. Harlani, as Harlan's red tail. Blocky in shape, says the book. Blood or brick red, but white, I am sure, underneath. White along its wing, which was not smoke, but rising now, one bird. I was coming back and couldn't breathe. And him, bruised, torn, bedridden, tubed, taken to the brink by his body and carried aloft. There he had fallen. This is what happened, said the medical team. Fallen and ripped aortal stenosis in the process of their repair. No, the white bird strained as trying to lift to a slight dihedral, the deepest deliberate wing beats, and barely above the snow-white flipped grasses and the shoulder, until I thought I would hit it. It happened, or it did not, in my way of thinking. And now why I saw two lengths of snake, helical and alive in the talons, heavy there, writhing, so the big bird strained for the length of time that it takes like the oiled inner organs of a live thing, heaving in shreds, the dogwoods, the doctors, and did I say the horrible winds all before. Now the air after stone, the old road empty, swept white by blossoms, by headlights, my father hovering still, why it flew so close. Why it was so terribly slow. I think I hoped it would tear me to pieces, lift me of my genus, helpless as wretched and 
drop me away. I turned back to the animal. No, it turned its back to me. Rude to drink water in front of you, but I'm going to. <laughs> I apologize. I sat outside for five minutes and the top of my head got hot. So <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't funny. All right. A different tone. Original, there are 15 new poems in this book. Um, and they were originally in three sections, and the sections marked different subjects. So those first two were part of a group of poems from my mother and father in their passing. Then there's a group of poems about a little island where I like to go um, in the Caribbean called St. John. So I'll read a couple of those. It is National Frog Month, by the way. That's another <laughs> one. It is. This is called Tree Frogs. I'm in the spirit of this. <laughs> Tree frogs. One, the stars. The still heat is a blown curtain. The curtain wavers then. Now two of them. And another from beyond the blue agave. Soon the whistling wheat e heat. The many, so many tree frogs. No bigger than thumbprints. Eleutoctus coqui. The common coqui. Which we've never seen but in books, not once. Now the purring, the rolling coo of the morning dove song of the island toads among the hundred frogs, and crickets grilly die in late day rising salt background waves as in the bay the small squall we didn't see at first is a gray-bellied cloud in the still yet azure twilight sky. And the container ship pulls on through the sheaf of mist, a distant bell among the white cedars. Can the ending of things ever be heard? So slowly it crawls with the gross weight of all our needs, our goods, our ghosts, such little things we are, and so much noise. After this is just a little. We came to the island. We stayed in the house. Rain and sun. Bougainvillea. Pink cedar. How many shadows slipped along walls or wetted the leaves of century plants? We saw clouds from the windows. Far boats. You left the bed and came back shaking. Your mother, her white hair, or something whose shape would never at last find you. Night palms clattering like hungry bowls. Crazy whistling of the island peepers. We walked to the water, walked back, we walked to the water, walked back. So two more poems from the new poems in this book. And these were in a section, I don't know what the hell this section was, and maybe why we didn't have a section anymore. But I believe they had a little bit more acute social conscience, something like that. This is a spring poem. This is called Checkpoint. It begins, I have to tell you a little story. It begins with a line from Emily Dickinson. So you can't. You should not do that. Begin with a line by Emily Dickinson, because you're going to suck <laughs> after that. But I did it anyway. Um, a couple of years ago, um, 
my partner and I went to, uh, in New York City, the Morgan Library, where there was a, a new display of Dickinson stuff. Just the coolest Dickinson stuff. I'm a geek for Dickinson anyway, but there on the wall were like manuscripts of Emily Dickinson in this little bitty spidery pencil writing on line paper. <sighs> there were pictures. There was her high school yearbook. Uh-huh. Yeah. How cool is that? Um, the portrait of her, there's only one, there may be two um, sitting there. And the thing that most amazed me, this isn't in the poem, you don't even need to know this, but it's just, you, you need to know this. There was, um, in a box about this big, behind glass, a locket of her hair, a long, coiled locket of her, ready for this, bright, red hair. Didn't know that. The photograph, it's kind of dark auburn, but it's an old photograph. The painting, it's probably dirty. Her hair, it looked like Lucille Ball. Bright red hair. Emily Dickinson. I love knowing that. Don't you? Yeah. Yeah? It's another thing that shows up a little later in this poem. I was doing some reading. Uh, there are groups around the country um, who help people prepare for interrogation from Homeland Security. I read a BuzzFeed article. If ICE captures you or catches you, they're going to ask you questions to trip you up. And this is some practice questions. So that turns out. It's a poem about migration. Checkpoint. These are the days when birds come back. These are the days, the birds. These days, these birds. These days are these birds. Let us see these days, these papers. When are these birds and where are your papers? Where are you going? Come back. Answer me where you are going behind the barn, the flame tree, our fire, our wings, these birds, behind the trees, the bursting winds, the birds, these days come back, they do not. There, what color is your ruby throat, your toothbrush, yellow breasted warbler, green flame, blue jay, marsh thrush, low among the light, the lush, low, timid leaf. She said, by the river, what fire is your nova, is your wife's hairbrush? Take off your shoes, take your hands off, stop right there. So many coming over as so many millions fewer wings. These papers of fragile bones vanish. They are not. Where are you going? I said, come back. Carol Sonnet. <clears throat> Where do you suppose they've gone? The beads. Now that you don't see them anymore. Four winged among flowers. Low sparks in the clover. Even at nightfall are they fanning? Have they gone another place? Bloomed with pollen, stuck to their bristles, waiting beyond us. Spring dwindle is what we call it. Collapsing neocotinoids, high level in pneumatic corn exhaust, loss of habitat or disappearing disease in the way of our kind, so to speak. What do you think they would call it? Language older than our ears. Were they saying it all along, even at daybreak?
I have over the last years been writing with more, trying to write with more alertness to such things. So here's a brand new one in that same, by brand new, it's about a year old. That's new. In that same sort of vein. The loneliness of animals. I don't think I know what it feels like. I know I don't. To drag one's self so slowly. I'm going to do little quotes here. I hate that. But there are little passages that I pull from a few other places, and I want to acknowledge that. I'm going to start over the loneliness of animals. I don't think I know what it feels like. I know I don't. To drag oneself so slowly, like a zombie, down a cracked, hard, rock-cut creek bed in Illinois, to be lifted, still churning one's legs, to be the subject of such testing, to be found to be Macrochiles Timoneki from one's own fine bloodline by DNA of the genus Chelydra a la Conrad Jacob Temenek, native to a region that makes up the northernmost end of the species range. And now a real shock to biologist Chris Phillips who'd been diving, hoping to find, he said, one male alligator snapping turtle with a transmitter on its back. The last one, precisely, he previously released in the area with hopes of spurring population growth. And not this. Female, at 22 pounds, way bigger than expected, spring-like neck dorsal ridges, like some plated dinosaur. So he held her, Ethan Kessler, grad student, just so as he was taught for the photo, hand behind her head, hand to the side along her shell back, ginger so not to lose a thumb to her steel trap jaws. The turtle's mouth is camouflaged and it possesses a verniform, i.e. worm-shaped appendage at the tip of its tongue to lure fish by imitating movements of a worm drawing prey to the mouth. Adds Wikipedia, they do not make particularly good pets. <laughs> so when they reintroduced her back into the wild, by which I think they mean dredged rivers, drained swamps, small wood runs, culverts, check dams, and irrigation crop circle excerpts. Her battery transmitter died immediately. And finding her in the water's depths again might take 30 years. Let's hope so. Trillium. Do you know that one? This is just about the time. Not quite. The spring ephemerals are not quite up yet. The trillium is one of the first. I go tromping around to look for them. Trillium. The first year I found it, I found it by accident, working my machete to make out of the woods a walking path. Not quite creekside, but in the tree shadow of the creek. Trillisai, or birth root, wake robin, or any kind of lily whose petals might wake a robin into wings, as this does, three-winged, if not creekside, but close beneath a hedge apple, itself 
not an apple. Its blossom is like a lily, in this case, trillium flexipedes for drooping, as I found the next year, maroon under three leaves and swinging there like a bell. The little brown-red bell blossom was gone the next day. And the next year, knocked or nosed down by deer. Picking the flower of trillium can injure the plant seriously, says my book. May die or take years to recover. So I built barricades of small branches, cages, crossbars, as soon as these new leaves uncapped, to keep out the deer, yet airy enough to let in some sun. Ephemeral angel wing of blossoms, half as light in the green long shadow of wild rye grasses, and the shadowy maroon blossoms hung for a week. More brown, peeled, seeded, then dropped. The next year, the drought year. Yet, I found it again this April, walking the path, which is not my path, not anymore. The deer have fled as well, deeper away from us. And us, not us anymore. Obstinate blooms. This one's just a little bit longer. You walk around in the woods out here. The beautiful woods out here. But you see a lot of dead trees. Ash trees. Do you know about the ash? Do you know about the emerald ash border? This little bug um, that gets in the tree and all the ashes are dying. Or dead. All of it. So I was trying I I was curious about where that little bug came from, why it got here. This is called, What is a Weed? Emerald, as in the leaf of the ash. Though nothing's burned, not yet, as the ash green gray-green fiery wingspan of the adult whose bullet body and flat black eyes are less the way we know them than by the trees, by the death of the trees, by the millions. The adults emerge a plenipennis of the genus Agrilus in May, June, July, then in bark crevices between layers of the diamond derma, females set their eggs, whose larvae in a week bore back into the trees. They chew the phloem. They eat the inner body of the bark, creating winding galleries as they feed. This cuts the flow of water nutrients to the tree. This causes dieback, causes death. What is a weed? What I saw was a tree. A thousand trees in the village. More. But one at the point of the street corner lot where all summer I held my girl by the back of her bike and ran the green block down. The tree was obvious, catalpa, its long three branching trunks splayed like a birch whose shag bark white parchment skin is equally unmistakable, leaves as big as a piece of paper if the page were a heart or head of a spade, and pale green foot-long at least bean pods dangling like ropey toys. Three trunks pushing from our one earth, equally thick, the same height, and then among two trunks, of waving catalpa, 
I saw ash leaves, fist-sized, but delicate, blooming from the third. All over the village, the ashes are dying. Already dead, my tree friend says. The scourge, emerald borer, rode in on shipping crates. Asia via Lake Erie, 2002. They dated to the month. And in bundles of firewood, in luggage of travelers, in bedding plants, their radiant splay spread like wildfire up Ontario, down through Ohio, Illinois, and now 7.5 billion ash trees. Mountain white, Fraxinus americana, and blue, fragrant, Carolina, green, of the family Oleaceae, of opposite branching, of compound pinnate leaf whose timber is wonderfully springy, excellent for oars and tools, and lends itself to steaming and turning, as in bent wood furniture, will die. Though some refer to them as trash. Trash ash. What is a weed? And the answerer says, a plant that doesn't fit the local plan. In my personal doctrine of signatures, you can tell the emerald ash borer simply by its hole, the letter D, as it emerges from the host, each circle with its flattened edge or side, a hundred or more, like buckshot on a tree sometimes, or on a tree braided to another tree. Two catalpas growing with a third. I pushed my daughter down the street, let go, and her laughter lit the waiting trees. Ash or trash, catalpa, oak, the neighborhood where she learned to fly. Then the trees grew wings. I think I'll read just two more. This is, I have to read this one. This is a poem called Swift, about Granville, <laughs> the metropolis. There's this thing in Granville, people don't know about it. Um, you've been there. There's a post office, old brick post office with a big old chimney. And in late July and August and into September, the chimney is the home for a flock, a massive flock of swifts. They live in the village, they hang out during the day, and about nighttime, about, this is 7.45, 8 o'clock, 8.15, when it's getting dusky that time of year, they start to assemble. You just see a few birds. And then we'll see a few more, and a few more, and pretty soon there are gazillions, I counted, gazillions. <laughs> and nobody knows this. I stand there on the corner looking at them. They fly, they're the only bird besides the bat, bat's not a bird, that flies with mm -hmm. an alternating wing. Um, you can tell them, they make a lot of noise. So I'm standing there, year after year, I watch these, and people come up and say, what, what are you doing? <laughs> And pretty soon there'll be a bunch of us having wet ice cream and standing in the corner <laughs> watching the Swifts and, and watching what they do. That's all this one's about. Swift. Swift into flight. The name as velocity. A Swift is one of two or three hundred swirling over the post office smokestack. First they rise, come dusk, to the high sky, flying from the ivy walls of the bank, a few at a time, up from graveyard oaks and backyards, then more, tightening to orbit in a block-wide world above the village. Now they are a flock. Now we're holding hands. 
were talking in whispers to our kind, who strolled in couples from the ice cream shop or bike her in small groups to see the birds. A voice in awe turns inward, as looking down into a canyon, the self grows small. Smaller swifts are larger for their singing. The spatter and high cheep the shrill of it, and their quick bat-like alternating wings, and the soft pewter sky sets off the black checkmark bodies of the birds that they skitter like water toward a drain. Now one veers, dives, as if wing shot, or worse, out of the sky, over the maw of the chimney, flailing, but then pulling out as another dips and the flock reverses. It's circling. They seem like leaves spinning in a storm, blown wild around us. And we, their witnesses, witness the way they finish. The first one simply drops into the flute. In four, five, in as many seconds, pulling out of the swirl, sweep down. So swiftly, we are alone. The sky is clear of everything but night. We are standing at a loss within it. I want to read a poem that I didn't write. It's National Poetry Month. It's good to do such things. This is a poem by someone who is dear to the magazine. W.S. Murrow, who died about three weeks ago. This is the very last poem in his very last book. He was 90, but he, three weeks ago, just didn't wake up. The present. As they were leaving the garden, one of the angels bent down to them and whispered, I am to give you this as you are leaving the garden. I do not know what it is or what it is for, what you will do with it. You will not be able to keep it, but you will not be able to keep anything. Yet they both reached at once for the present, and when their hands met, they laughed. Thank you. Thank you for coming on a beautiful day. Does anyone have questions for David? Oh, yeah. <laughs> forgot about that. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you see the project of this book different? Um, than the rest of your body of work so far, and if so, how might you describe it? I don't know exactly what you mean. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it took me something like, well, do the math, seven years to do this mm -hmm. book. I did a version of this book in 2012 and 2013, put together a new and selected. Um, showed it to my buddies and messed around with it for about a year. I showed it to my editor. And she said, yeah, you can do this. You want to wait? She knew that I was working on a big poem, um, really a big one. It's the only big one in this book called Scavenger Loop. And she said, why don't you finish that one and see what that is? So I finished that one. In 2013, my mother died. And that became the part of that big poem that I didn't know how to write. And then I finished that poem and finished a whole book. And we did that book. And I had set this aside. So about, well, 2017, I thought, OK, I'll give it a whirl again. And printed out a whole bunch of stuff. And looked, just started over completely. Looked at all my books. 
sat, I did the thing, you know, sat in my floor and put a pile here and moved a pile over there, moved one over there, and did that for about six months and then sent it to some buddies and kicked it around. It was bigger, it was shorter, it was in different orders. I wanted this one to be really severe. It's not a very big book for somebody who's old <laughs> and, you know, has a lot of poems. Um, I left out poems I like. I left out poems I do at readings. I just wanted this one to be a new thing. Um, and I'm proud of that. There are only seven poems from each of my books and no poems from my first book. And then I took books number two and three and just picked seven altogether from those two books. But not, so they're not many. I really like that. I really like the leanness of that. I know poets who are 45 years old and have a new and selective book and they're 400 pages long. I just find that, there are lots of different words for what I find. <laughs> <laughs> Questionable. <laughs> And it goes backwards chronologically. It goes from new to old, which is weird. My editor wasn't sure about that. I said, no, let's do that. That's what and the oldest poem in my book is I wrote in 1983. So it has some reach. I, that didn't answer your question, Claire. But. No, but I liked it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, your, your newer work and scattered throughout your older work, I feel like you are, uh, there's an eco poetic mode that you're writing in. Um, yeah, there is. And so I was wondering, and I talk about this with my students, about, about the contemporary nature poem. Yeah. And given the state of the earth, is it possible to now just write an ode, just an element of nature, and have it be as simple as that? Or now, we, are we required now to write about nature through the lens of no disaster? We're not. We've never written a, a simple poem. There's never been a poem without irony. So I'm not sure. And you know, it's terrible. I was going to write a poem about um, that pine tree. Um, it would always have an undertone of some kind of winking or irony, or we know this already been there. But there's more pointed political urgency. There's a guy named John Shoptaw um, who wrote a really wonderful little article for Poetry Magazine two or three years ago where he described the move from over the last, in American poetry, something like the last 40 years from nature poetry to environmental poetry to eco poetry as a kind of growing alertness to action, that is to be activist and to name names. Um, but yes, I think it is possible to write a simple poem. I love them. They don't live by themselves. They live in a time, and the time adds part of the narrative to the poem that the poem doesn't even need to supply. We know that they don't live by themselves. They live in an era, and our era is trying to be alert um, to disaster, though it's too late. Do you think that? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know either. I don't want anybody to tell me I can't do anything. That's the thing. <laughs> you, know, you can't write a simple poem. Oh, yeah? <laughs> I'm going to write one so simple it'll be stupid. <laughs> I'll show you. <laughs> no, I think that you can't in some way remove a single poem from a larger milieu or context. Anybody? Okay. All right. Well, we have David's book for sale in the back if he has a pocket to sign them. We have a number of the actually. Um, and thank you for coming. Can you give them another?